It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. In today's episode, money and relationships. Talking about finances has long been a a problem in many marriages, but there are new challenges today that I want to talk about that are affecting couples at all different stages of involvement. And guess what? Coming up later, paper products are going up in price after coming way, way down in price. And you're never going to believe the industry source reason why that's happening. And I will fill you in on that. So I want to talk about something right now. And Clark, I just wanted to quickly read you a question that came in to the show that's about what you're talking about. So maybe you can oh. answer it. It's from Bo in Kentucky. Um, maybe when you're talking about this, he said, I wanted to know if Clark has any recommendations about couples financial counseling. Okay. So that's all I get is couples financial counseling is a kickoff. Okay. Okay. So I'm glad that you're asking that question because this has been something that has been on my radar for a number of years is that couples seem to be comfortable communicating about so many things, even really intimate things, but cannot seem to get across the threshold of talking about money. Part of it is the ages that people are coupling are generally significantly later than they used to be. People used to pick out a partner uh, very, very young. And today, more often, late 20s into the 30s is where people may couple up. And whether that is living with somebody or being married to them, it's later. And so people have already established their own financial habits and they have their own, maybe they have their own retirement accounts, maybe they have their own savings account, maybe they got a lot of debts. And so when couples get together, it's this very awkward dance. How do you get to talking about money? And it's not necessary to do this too early. I mean, I there was a thing last year where I, I don't know who came up with the idea of testing how likely somebody was uh, willing to go out with you based on your credit score. And I thought that was really interesting that that's so unromantic that people wouldn't even go out on a first date with you if they knew your credit score was terrible. Wow. But let's go the other way. You start dating someone or you decide to uh, establish a life together, what is fair game to be on the table? I think it's really important that couples discuss their goals. You know, what is it they hope to have happen in their lives and when they want it to have happen? And part of that is the money discussion because it's key that as couples bring their lives together, they don't necessarily have to bring their finances together, but their attitudes about finance become really important and can become a flashpoint in a relationship or in a marriage. Because if one of you comes in and everything is about financially living for today and Visa and MasterCard solve all because I see it, I want it, that settles it because I say charge it. And then someone else is like, well, you know, I really can't do that right now because I don't have the resources for it. And it doesn't mean if in a couple each have very different attitudes about money that it can't work, but it means that knowing where the other is financially And where their attitudes are, very important. And over time, it will matter more. Because if there are long-time goals that you want to achieve, it is important that you be going towards the same direction. 
Because you don't want to be in a position where you're together for decades and one of you is like you're all uh, psyched uh, towards the direction of being able to retire and travel and the other owes money to everybody and has no money towards the future. Because then the one who has saved so much and put so much money aside for the future, real resentment builds up towards the person who hasn't saved anything and still owes everybody money. This is not a conversation. This is an ongoing conversation. And don't do it when something has gone wrong. Make a point of discussing things about money at a neutral or positive time. Never when something bad has happened financially. It's because most people don't talk about it till the wallet's on fire. It's really important for a couple to have ongoing conversations about money and goals and the rest. And what are each's attitudes about borrowing money? When do you borrow money? What's a safe amount to have that you owe to various people, to various banks, for various purposes? The more you discuss, the more trust there is in a relationship. I've shared with you in the past about couples who hide accounts from each other and how corrosive that is to a relationship. And it doesn't mean that you commingle your funds, but I do believe that it's really useful for a couple to have a house account, to pay rent, mortgage, uh, ongoing bills that are joint bills, that you have an account that you each put funding into and you determine your own formula for it. If one of you makes much more money than the other, you may have an unbalanced how much each of you puts in. Whatever it is that's going to work for you comes about from the conversations you have from each other. You can't just suppose that they feel like you do and think like you do and act like you do. That's why the conversations are important. So you can have all the relationship fun together. You don't want things eating at that relationship. And I can tell you, I've learned over the years that when you have these differences about money and you don't have conversations about money, it will tear at the joy that the two of you have together. Krista? So for Bo, what would you recommend? Uh, read it again because so that he, was so long ago. He wanted to know about financial counseling for couples. So it could be one or two scenarios, I would say. Like either they could be in financial trouble, so maybe they need a counselor for that, or just trying to get on the same page. And I'll say from my perspective, hiring somebody who's a uh, fee-only fiduciary planner and sitting down with my husband, and I, even if you pay him for an hour, is great to help you set goals too and work together. So if you're in that kind of situation... I do think yeah, that so I, I agree completely with what you said in a situation where it's like goal setting moving forward. Um, and I want it to be a fee only planner, of course. And we have on Clark.com how to do that. But the other scenario is financial counseling if you're in financial trouble. And usually, and this is so open ended right. that we can only uh, suppose what we're talking about here. The National Foundation for Credit Counseling at NFCC.org has counseling available and it forces couples to put all their chips on the table. And you have to talk about the obligations you have, the income you have, and can you just meet the daily expenses? And I don't want it to get to that point. That's why I want so much for there to be ongoing conversations. Remember, again, never out of anger, never out of a time that there's a financial fire. You want to have those conversations when neither party is going to be naturally in a defensive mode. Yeah, I remember when we were younger, my husband and I would do Friday night finance meetings. Like, just They could be very brief, but we came to a place where we needed to talk once a week about how we were doing and so we would have, get pizza on Friday nights and sit. We'd have a conversation, look how we did the last week. And then, so we don't have to do that anymore, but that was helpful for well, us. Well, the interesting thing in, uh, in your relationship with Mike 
is that early on he was really somebody who I worry about tomorrow and now he's totally focused Mm -hmm. and is a phenomenal saver for the future yes and you were always there but he has progressed that direction over the years (laughs) well i actually listened to you before i started working for you so i owe you and your advice for getting me started all right let's go to some other questions this one's from joanne in north carolina my husband and i are both in our early 50s and have no outstanding debt our home and automobiles have been paid in full over the last few years We have our general household bills that are always paid before the due date. Both of our credit scores were always 800 or above. Mine still is. However, my husband's credit score has dropped to 720. The only thing I have that my husband does not have is a credit card. I use it and pay it off monthly. Is this what's keeping my credit score up? Is getting a credit card to use and paying it off monthly his best option? We don't like debt, especially in this economy. Will his score keep dropping if we don't do something? Almost certainly, yes. Um, You're living this debt-free existence. And so now the credit system has no way really for him to figure out how he would meet credit obligations. And he doesn't need credit. And so who cares what the credit score is? You should care because it affects so many other things. Uh, Auto insurance, number one, and homeowner's insurance, number two. Whether you can get it and what premiums you will pay are based primarily on your credit score. So yes, as weird as it is, it would be very much to your husband's advantage to get a credit card and use it. You don't have to use it a lot, but use it, pay the balance in full, and he will see his credit score start to heal. And I'm so much a fan of the Noah's Ark rule for credit cards that each of you have two major credit cards, each that you have in your own name. And that is a perfect number, just just the right amount of credit that, to have active so that your credit scores will remain rock solid. Aaron in Ohio says, I'm 25 and looking forward to graduating from optometry school this May and currently only have two credit cards. Well, that's pretty good. That's Noah's Ark. (laughs) Both as an authorized user through my parents. I would like to get a card with good rewards prior to graduation for making purchases to start my professional career, setting up a new apartment, and a small post-graduation trip. How should I go about acquiring a new card prior to starting my job? When applying, should I report my income as my expected income once I start my job in July even though I will not receive the paycheck before the time of application. My credit score is in the mid-700s, and I have so far been tentative to apply for a secured card because I know I'll have an ample income very soon. So you don't need a secured card. What you do want to do is you want to apply for a student credit card. Pretty much all the major issuers have student cards because they are the most profitable segment of the credit card market and also the least likely to default. People who are in college or professional school like you are, are ultra low risk for the credit card companies. And so that's why they all have these student cards. You can get one of those. You do not need a co-signer. You um, will not have, there will be no secured card about it. The fact that you already have a solid credit score because you've been an authorized user will help you. And then once you're out in the work world, you'll be able to get a traditional card. Now, these student cards are real cards. They're reported like any other card. It's just the normal income requirements are waived, but you must obtain them before you graduate. And Elaine in Florida says, after listening to your podcast, I called Vanguard to open a money market account. They only have money market funds, which are not FDIC insured. I did it anyway, even after reading the differences between money market funds and money market accounts. Did I do the right thing? You absolutely did the right thing. And Elaine, you choose what level of risk you want to take in a money market fund with Vanguard, Fidelity, or Schwab, because The risk of a money market fund, they are established and set up to be a $1 fixed share price. And you can go in one that uh, invests the money in corporate obligations or various government obligations. You can go in a U.S. Treasury money market fund. You can go in a government obligations money market fund. Those are the two absolute safest. In fact, a Treasury money market fund is superior safety-wise 
to an FDIC insured account at a bank because one is the government, the other is the government backing up a private financial institution or semi-private, a bank. So you don't have FDIC insurance with these accounts at Fidelity, Vanguard, or Schwab, but you can be in accounts with them that are as safe as safe could possibly be direct obligations of the U.S. government. So don't worry, be happy, and rest easy. Uh, coming up ahead, I got a flashback to three years ago. Where's the paper towels? Where's the toilet paper? We're going to talk about that. If we didn't have enough to worry about when the COVID pandemic started in 20 and people were being laid off by the tens of millions and all that, we then had shortages of so many goods and nothing was more a panic with people than being able to get paper products like toilet paper and paper towels. And I remember all the way into 21, if you went into physical stores, you'd see the signs limiting consumption of so many things. Remember when we were obsessed with um, those wipes? What are those uh, disinfecting wipes? And they'd be limit one per container. And there were all these limits on toilet paper. And there are all these brands of toilet paper that were showing up and paper towels that no one had ever heard of. And that was all because of the various supply chain disruptions. And then think about people who work in construction or you were adding onto your home. Let's say you were adding a deck to your house or whatever. And you're going to buy lumber and it was going crazy that lumber was just skyrocketing in price. Well, now... The opposite has happened with lumber. Lumber is down by two-thirds over the last year in cost. And so now the mills that were running full tilt, a lot of them have gone quiet. And there's not as much lumber needed for the housing market and a slower housing market. And when lumber is produced in a sawmill, there's all this byproduct that is then used what uh, the waste becomes, paper towels, toilet paper, napkins, things like that. Well, now there's less of that. And that's why you may have seen these price bumps and the cost of paper goods of late. It's weird how we've had multiple years of disruptions, first with supply chain, now supply chains in almost all economic sectors have healed. I said almost all. And now it's not a supply chain issue. It's an actual production issue. And that's why you may see prices that have come so nicely down on paper goods that we buy suddenly seeing a bump up. Now, as far as us struggling to find a roll of toilet paper or find a supply of paper towels, that's not really in the cards. There's nothing severe enough that's going to happen, but the prices being higher, that is. And you know, it's there's something we did as a family back in 20 that is actually stuck in our house. Never even knew it existed. There are these reusable um, cloth replacements for paper towels and took me a while to get used to them but they roll on a roll and you use them then you wash them and then you use them again and it eliminates the paper towels and that became something of necessity when it was hard to find paper towels but it's something that we still do in our household now we use both depending on the circumstance and so we as humans always adjust. We always figure out ways to deal with things. Uh, one of the funny things that I've only read about in trade publications and the business press is when the toilet paper shortage was a real thing back in 20, a lot of people put in these, um, these attachments to their toilets that use water instead of toilet paper when you were done and Krista you remember in Japan that's how they do it yeah, anyway it's like a built-in bidet yeah and so 
people do, one of the great things about us as humans is we do adapt to circumstances. And that's one where we absolutely did. I have to tell you, uh, speaking of not being able to adapt with toilet paper, we did try in our household the new, I don't know if it's new, new, but the Kirkland Signature, like, softer paper, like the one that's supposed to be better. You were bragging on it. The one that comes with the funny kind of, what's that color on the front? It's like a cross between yeah, pink like and purple. Yeah, it's like a lavender thing. Yeah. No, I wasn't. Is lavender I mean, I, I might cross have been bragging, between pink and purple? Uh -huh. I might okay. have been bragging that I was going to try it, but it gets two thumbs down from the DBS household, I have to tell you. So you paid all that premium price to get the Costco Kirkland Signature premium toilet paper, and it was no good. We're back to Charmin Ultra. Okay, which so, was on sale recently at Costco. Whenever it's on sale, we buy extra. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Becky in Florida says, during a recent trip to St. Thomas, I booked a catamaran tour through a website which says they have a, the lowest price guarantee. We enjoyed the trip, but found out from some of the other passengers that we paid $150 more for two people than they did. They booked directly through the catamaran company. I emailed the website with proof of the cheaper cost through the catamaran company, and they said that our tour was different. The only difference was the word luxurious in the title. I even emailed the catamaran company, which said that it was always more expensive to book through a third party. Is this a scam, much like the mattress companies who slightly change their mattresses that you can't really compare apples to apples? Also, at this point, what more can I do other than leave a bad review on several sites, such as TripAdvisor and the tour company's own site? File a complaint at BBB.org about this tour operator. We've had many complaints about this. This is not really a tour operator. They are a booking service. And so there's an additional markup. And something you should know, when you're going somewhere in the Caribbean, you're going somewhere where it's fun in the sun, the, uh, the event you want to do, the tour, almost always is cheaper direct because of all the markups they're having to pay um, to the various, could be, they're paying a local tour operator commission who then is paying the outside referral service like this that's removed at least two steps from the actual catamaran trip you took. And they're, they're really stupid in a situation where you, you caught them on their low price guarantee. They just didn't say, you're right, here's your money back. That is really foolish because now you're going to post these reviews and you're going to file your BBB complaint and we'll see what happens with that. But uh, the problem with any of these things is you've got to do your own research and you've got to contact the actual service provider directly. Well, to call that a problem really isn't accurate. One other thing, a lot of times when you're doing something uh, that's an activity, wherever it is at a resort, wherever, and you book through a tour operator and they're picking you up at your hotel and they're taking you to whatever it is. There's another markup for that. Many times it's a lot cheaper if you get to whatever the activity is on your own and then you pick up the trip there from the actual provider of that trip. This is from Wiggins in Texas. I read your article from 2020 on the pros and cons of buying a rental vehicle. Since conditions have changed since then, I was wondering what advice you have now. It's even a worse idea to buy a vehicle from a rental car fleet than it ever was. I rent cars um, a few dozen times a year, and I will tell you the quality of the rental fleet has gone down, 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 with the disruptions in the new and used vehicle market. I think that will improve through 23 and be normalized in 24, but the vehicles are ending up in the rental fleets for far more miles than they used to. They're not being maintained well by the rental car companies because they were not used to having to take care of vehicles that might have as many as 50,000 miles on them and so the vehicles are suffering from neglect. The good news for you, though, is the used vehicle market, prices have come down a whole lot from where they were, and many brands are now 
showing a lot more inventory of new vehicles on their lots. One of the key pressures that pushed up the price of used vehicles so much is there was such an extreme shortage of production of new vehicles, and that is getting back more to normal from most automakers. The chip shortage has alleviated a lot of supply chain disruptions, gone away from the suppliers the automobile manufacturers buy from. And so the market is going to become more a consumer-friendly market. So I would not look at buying a used vehicle from one of the rental fleets. I think it's asking for trouble. And later this week, actually, I actually have you slotted to talk about how to buy a car in this market. So we will, Great. you'll get to that in more depth. Kathy in Illinois says, I'm one year into a three-year car lease and finding I'm going way over my mileage. Would I be better off buying the lease out early or paying 25 cents a mile for the extra 5,000 miles? So what you do is uh, you just wait till the end of the lease and buy the vehicle under the residual that is in that lease because the mileage charge we're talking about, uh, you think you're going to end up 5,000 miles over, 25 cents a mile, so 1,250 miles, $1,250. You'll have to decide at that time if you want to pay the overage or if you've loved the vehicle and the residual buyout is a fair amount, you just buy the vehicle at that time. So you don't want to make that decision now. You want to let the two more years of that lease run before you make that decision on whether you buy this vehicle at the end of the lease or just take your lumps and pay for the excess mileage. And I want to thank you so much for joining us on today's episode. And the thought I want to leave you with, if you're uh, part of a couple and you heard me talking about that money conversation don't put it off. When the time is right, start the conversations. And remember, it's not a talk. It's an ongoing dialogue with a couple. Have a great one.